choosing soul is in many ways countercultural. It's not the mainstream narrative that we see on the news, right? And yet, you may feel a very deep longing to include more soul in your work. Now, our minds though, they might wonder, why? Why soul? That's why in this video, I'm going to share with you the holy grail for embodied sustainable change and the scientific background, the explanations for why soul-based change is so extraordinarily powerful. I'm Annemiek van Helsingen. I'm a long-time coach and spent 18 years teaching coaches. Through this academy, we have reached over 3,500 coaches, healers and therapists worldwide. When my immune system forced me to stop my corporate work in 2012, it also forced me to go deep down to the core of who I really am and what I'm here to do. Now, while some days walking up the stairs and taking care of a one-year-old was beyond what I could do, it became very apparent that to me spirituality wasn't optional, that it needs to be part of everything I do in a very practical way. If I didn't listen, I'd be back in bed. Now this led to the birth of soul-based coaching as a modality, where I took some of the core practices of ancient spiritual traditions and merged them with the cutting edge coaching tools that I'd been teaching all along. And what happened was that I saw people make incredible embodied sustainable changes with a depth of process that was awe inspiring. Now maybe you have had that experience where you wanted something to change in your life and you worked really hard to make it happen. But maybe you've also had that experience where you wanted something and for some reason it started to happen almost by itself. Chances are that then you were tapped into your innate capacity for healing and change. Because when you are, changes become almost inevitable. You can probably understand our delight when we found out that science has caught up with what we've seen happening all along over the years. And that's why I want to share with you the science behind the impact of this work. First of all, so that your logical mind can start to understand the biology, the neurobiology that is making this possible. But secondly, I want you to be ready so that you can find out how you can do this, how you can help people tap into that innate capacity for healing and change. Because there's a million places that people can go for outside answers, but there's very few places that people can go to skillfully be guided to their own deepest knowing and the vast resources that live inside of them. Ready? You may have heard it said that we create our own experience of reality. And that is shorthand for a much more intricate process. Researchers have shown that our brains don't just passively perceive the world, but they actively construct our personal reality, weaving it from our memories, our perceptions, our expectations, and our imagination. So you could say that we get the reality that our brain expects, but that's not all. In this process of meaning making, our body and the information stored in our tissues, our muscle memory, and even our cellular memory through our DNA plays an integral part. Biologists have found proof that cognition and consciousness exist in simple organisms without what are technically considered brains. They're able to remember and respond to outside stimulants that they would like to avoid or embrace. What a lot of us already know from experience can finally be scientifically proven. Consciousness is everywhere in the body and it's not limited to humans. Now remember the two ways that you've experienced change yourself, the one where it was hard work and the one where the process almost seemed to happen by itself. In that last one, you most likely used all of your resources and potential, all consciousness available to you. Let's have a closer look at that. And for this, I'm making a sidestep to touch on wisdom from ancient wisdom traditions, which by definition deal largely with the unknowable and are therefore outside of the bounds of our Western scientific methodologies that measure what we can see and touch, break it down in small pieces to explain cause and effect from the paradigm of what we already know. But these ancient traditions have proven themselves useful for over thousands of years and many traditions have significant overlap. But we will be back to our modern day science and the biology of change afterwards. 
Now the intelligence that we each are, the sum of our abilities to know, to act, to change, actually goes beyond what our brain is and even our body brings. There's a flow of intelligence that flows through us that gives us the power to act, the direction to move in. And that intelligence isn't just the sum of our memories, perception, expectations and imagination. It isn't just inside of us, separate from everything else. It is what is called Shakti in Hinduism. It comes directly from what some people call source. Here is a way to start making that visual. Here is an example of a popular coaching model, the logical levels from Bateson and Dilt. In short, you would analyze a client's experience from these various lenses. And with increased understanding, change can start to happen. So you can see that it ranges this model from environment all the way up to purpose. But what if being human is a lot more than just that? So we use another triangle to complement the logical levels. Right above purpose is that Shakti, that creative life force that moves through us and that connects us with our purpose. And that field of Shakti connects us to a lot more, a lot of other aspects, dimensions of being human. Not all of them are relevant to every person and that's totally okay. But Shakti directly connects us to source, to the divine, to the wisdom stored in our body, to the natural world and to spiritual guides or past life if a client wants to go there. The way Shakti moves through all these layers, that brings healing and change, as if by itself. And as complex as that may sound from a coaching perspective, our client's system actually gives very clear signposts for where to guide their attention. Now this sidestep is not just to show you how we're all connected to a bigger whole, but the point here for you as a coach, therapist or healer is that we and our clients have access to resources that lay way beyond what our logical mind and even science can imagine or explain. But science can help show what happens when we help people tap into that field of Shakti. And for this, we turn to psychology professor and body worker Alan Fogel, who coined the term embodied self-awareness. And he says it's the present moment experiencing of sensations that arise from within our bodies, including our emotions. To be embodied means that experiences are felt directly as arising from within the body without intervening thought. And you see that he's pointing to an experience where thought and what we usually refer to as our logical mind isn't leading. Now, when we look at the biological components of ESA, embodied self-awareness, there are four different types. There's interoceptive feelings, the felt sense of the body's internal condition, things like feeling icky or strong, weak, tense. There's proprioceptive feelings, this felt sense of the body in relation to the environment and other people, like equilibrium or disequilibrium, rigidity, fluidity, coordination or disconnection of body parts, interpersonal distance. Then there is the autonomic, hormonal and immune system feelings that are all feelings of being alive in an organismic human body. Things like heartbeat, blood pulsation, sweatiness, fatigue, excitement, and then there's the emotional feelings like happy, sad, angry, all of them. Now the neural networks for these four different types of felt experience are linked to the autonomic, the cardiovascular, the respiratory, digestive, hormonal and immune systems. And what has become clear is that these systems can all function in a better way, in a healthier manner from direct awareness of body sensations and emotions. Now this is where we see that biologically, body and mind are one. And embodied self-awareness brings us a biological, innate capacity to heal. And there's one more thing that is vital for us if we want to support people in the best way possible and help them activate that innate capacity for healing and change. And that's that there are three different types of ESA, of embodied self-awareness. And one of them is our holy grail for change work. I'll briefly touch on all three of them so that you understand the difference. The first type is called modulated ESA. This is the state that most people are in most of the time. We have some embodied self-awareness and we tap into what our body is experiencing, grounding or coming back to ourselves, but then we go back to purposeful, intentional thought with a specific focus. 
right? Here we see primarily sympathetic arousal and engagement. It's about being busy, uh, creative, pleasurable, uh, engaging in work or dance or social activities. And there's what's called modulated social relational engagement. We have a goal or intention to be with others. Second type is dysregulated embodied self-awareness. Because stress and trauma can impact our ability to have embodied self-awareness, they can alter the felt sense of the body and even block those crucial pathways for survival, self-regulation and healing. Now we teach more about this state in our coach training so that our coaches are well equipped to work with a wide range of people and know how to determine if a client needs more support and how to navigate that in a professional way. Then there's our holy grail, restorative embodied self-awareness. This is the biological state where the innate capacity for healing and change is activated. Now, in this state, the felt experience is sustained and entirely in the present moment. There is non-conceptual thought in the form of evocative words and images that support sustained ESA, including things like free association, daydreaming, words, sounds, and yes, embodied metaphor. Now, what's important to realize is that if you have any logical thoughts, judgments, plans, strategies, or interpretations, you're not in restorative ESA. Now, what happens here is that there's an activation of the ventral vagal parasympathetic nervous system and the dorsal vagal immobilization without fear system, which means that there is a, a relaxation and a spreading of sense of ease and warmth and peace and contentment. Also, there's a warm and tender social relational engagement. And when your client is in RISA, in restorative embodied self-awareness, their body and mind are in a process of healing with all of the major systems in their biology working better. What's even more interesting is that change work while done in this state is very effective, which is no wonder because we get access to that whole field of Shakti and everything it connects us to, we can feel life happening through us. But according to Professor Fogel, we can't help people take step one, two, three and have them arrive in Risa. And the nature of this state means that as soon as you start to strategize and bring back conceptual thought, the state is broken. So Professor Fogel concluded that this state was rare in therapeutic or change contexts. But we respectfully and wholeheartedly disagree because we see it happen in just about every soul-based coaching session. And so there's a process that you can follow to help your clients in RISA. Soul-based coaching gives you that process. Also in most coaching and therapeutic modalities, there are things that you do that will most definitely take clients out of RISA. And you'll want to know what those are. Because there is a million places that people can go to get outside answers. But there's very few places people can go to, find, to skillfully be guided towards their own deepest knowing and their own vast resources. Join us in the masterclass of February 12th 4 p.m. Central European time. Choose soul.